afternoon. We are going to begin this meeting of the Arts, Parks, and River Committee on this day, Monday, November 16th, uh, 2015. I'd like to call this meeting to order. We'll get to public comment cards in, uh, in a moment, but at this time I'd like to uh, recommend that we take items one, two, three, and four uh, on consent, but we're still going to hear the, the, the comments on that. But I'd also I'd like to continue item seven without objection. Continue item seven. Are we good with that? No objection. No objection. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, so at this time, we do have several uh, comment cards on every item uh, from Mr. Spindler. So I'd like to give you three minutes for your uh, comment on the agenda items, Mr. Spindler, if you could step up to the microphone three minutes for your comments. And again, keep in mind that we've continued item seven. I came here for item seven. All right. Okay. Good. A, a lousy three minutes for everything. That's good. So. We have ourselves, the most important item today was continued, so we can't talk about the most important item. Item five, vending permit process in city parks and recreation facilities. Why do you need to have a permit to vend in a park? So again, there's been a lot of people that have been coming to these meetings and committee meetings regarding this so-called vending permit process. These are people that sell, you know, tacos and taco stands and trinkets and stuff like that. Getting a city business license is the permit you need to have a business in the city of Los Angeles, and that's all you should be required to have. Once you have that, you should, you should be able in a public space to be able to conduct a lawful business. Now you have the city of Los Angeles and the city of Glendale mixing their juices again on another deal as they were doing before. And again, I urge other neighboring cities do not do business with the city of Los Angeles. It is, the city of Los Angeles is a criminal organization. It is a criminal run city. As last Tuesday, when I was illegally arrested and tortured for 13 and a half hours waiting at a police commission meeting. That's what the city of L.A. is all about. So the city of Glendale doesn't have to do that. They're not that kind of people. So the city of Glendale, find somebody else to make these deals and these contracts with. Do not do business with the city of Los Angeles, because the city of Los Angeles is a loser. Everything they do in this city is a loser compared to every other place in the world. But again, the city of Burbank, the city of Glendale, they've been tiptoeing and doing more of these deals with DWP and LA City. In the end, you're going to pay, and you're going to pay big because whatever you're doing with this city, it's going to be a disaster. So don't do it. And then we have the Arts Development Fee Program and Expenditure Fee Status on item number five. What is this? So the Department of Cultural Affairs, they handle many different things, and they used to allow people in Van Nuys, for example, on teleconference to attend city council meetings. So in the budget for the cultural affairs, why don't we allow video conferencing in Van Nuys? So that way, when you're in Van Nuys, it'll be less difficult for people to be illegally arrested and detained in downtown Los Angeles with Charlie Beck's goons. That brings us to item five. Mr. Eric Villanueva, will you please read item five? Oh, do my apologies. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> item number five, motion price Wezar Cedillo relative to the vending permit process in city parks and recreational facilities. This item is also referred to Economic Development Committee. Thank you, Mr. Sutton Willis. I got that wrong. My apologies. No worries. Um, all right, if we could uh, please have, I believe, Kevin Regan from Recreation and Parks step forward along with Felipe Chavez from the CLA. Kevin. Fellas, I just called you up, both of you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> all right.
Well, good morning, Council Members. My name is Kevin Regan. I'm Assistant General Manager of Operations for the Department of Recreation and Parks. And with me uh, from the CLA's office is Felipe Valdivia. Hope I said oh. that correctly. Valladolid. Oh. So I got your last, I'm getting everything wrong today. Sort of kind of Valdivia. close. Valdivia, where did I get this? Okay. Anyway, Felipe is, uh, been doing a lot of really great work on on um, the program for sidewalk vending that the council has asked us to look at and as a part of that we have also um, been working with uh, the CLA for about a year in actuality now on um, determining exactly how the same program would work in parks so uh, we're here really to um, um, respond to you and ask answer any questions you may have regarding the motion that is before you Mr. Valdivia, anything to add? Um, at this time, well, I'm Felipe Chavez with the CLA's office. So, I thought he just said you're Valdivia. Uh, Valladolid Chavez, sorry. Okay. Oh. So I, I was right. Your last name is Chavez. Okay. I'm com I was completely wrong. All right. I would believe him in terms of what, okay. he, <laughs> rather than me. <laughs> Please. Yes. Good morning. Um, I uh, have been working uh, with city departments to respond to a motion that was introduced by uh, council members Price and Weezar um, relative to sidewalk vending, uh, to vending on city sidewalks and parks. Um, the motion has, has, was heard in economic development three times. Uh, the last time it was heard, it was in, on October 27th, and uh, at that time, the committee considered uh, a report which included several models uh, with relation to sidewalk vending. Um, the three models that we presented had to do with uh, uh, a citywide policy, which meant vending in, uh, on city sidewalks citywide with certain restrictions. Um, another model was uh, limiting sidewalk vending to certain districts. And the third model was a hybrid of both which would be citywide with special districts within that policy. Um, the committee uh, took action, approved the item, and then moved forward. Uh, the motion was also referred to a uh, public works committee. And also, um, so we're just waiting for it to be heard in council. Terrific. And before I, I have a lot of questions and, and a lot of thoughts to, to, to get out there, but um, there is often a lack of clarity on the difference between sales and services on city sidewalks and sales and services in parks. Could each of you uh, state your understanding of the, the difference between the two? <clears throat> um, well, I can ask Felipe to talk, uh, um, you know, regarding the exact legality of the sidewalk vending. Um, however, uh, I can tell you a little bit about parks. So it's important that we understand charter provisions when we're talking about um, anything that really that takes place in a LA City Park. So the charter um, states that any activities that take place in LA City Parks must serve a park purpose. So um, it's important to note that just because an individual entrepreneur wants to conduct a business opportunity of any kind in a city park does not mean that they have any type of a right to do that. It's typically the other way around. Um, the city and the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks and really the community and many times the council will determine that there is a need in a particular park for a particular type of service, whether it's vending, whether it's a uh, concession opportunity, whether it's um, services or sales of merchandise. Um, either one. So if those, if those services or those sales are necessary in a particular part of a park, then it can be permitted. It's not just because someone says, hey, I have a great idea. I'd like to sell something on the corner of this park. Um, so that's important to note that, that parks are different than streets and they are different than sidewalks under the law and under the charter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, with respect to uh, respect to uh, sidewalk bending or bending on sidewalks, um, that is governed by Section 4200B of the Municipal Code, and it's currently prohibited. So no bending can be uh, can occur on si on the sidewalks at this time. Um, 4200M allows uh, bending in special districts. So both of those are uh, are governed by Section 4200. 
and are enforced by the Public Works Department and the Police Department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And council members, I might add that as of September 29th of this year, um, code section, amended code sections of, of Municipal Code Section 63.44 pertaining to parks um, are now um, uh, vending, unpermitted, unregulated vending in parks is currently illegal mm -hmm. as of today. Okay, thank you. Just a quick follow up yes, on, Mr. Bloomfield. Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of questions, but just to follow up on the, the sidewalk versus park. The park, the sidewalks that are actually in the park, like you have a parking lot, you've got all the greenery and the baseball fields, and you have that sidewalk that goes from the sidewalk and goes right into the park area. I often see people vending there. Is that considered park or sidewalk? So it really depends. And not to get too technical, but I mean, the, the honest answer is to, to really know you'd have to pull a profile map and look at the dedication. However, let me tell you in general terms. So um, sidewalks that are dedicated sidewalks that are typically like a cement sidewalk, curb, gutter, and then street, those are typically in the public right of way and those are consider considered um, you know, city sidewalks under the 4200 series of municipal code. Um, anything inside the park typically is going to be a park sidewalk or road. There's even park roads that are not dedicated city streets, say in Griffith Park, Elysian Park, et cetera. So yes, it is possible to have a sidewalk in a park that is not a uh, public sidewalk in the right of way. Mm -hmm. So to follow up on that just a little bit, so for example, the sidewalk that surrounds all of Echo Park, that's considered a city sidewalk or is it considered part of Echo Park? To my knowledge, that is a dedicated city sidewalk. It is not part of Echo Park. Now, once you step inside the park boundary, which you know typically kind of starts at the turf grass mm -hmm. in, at that park, um, there's a number of sidewalks and pathways that run through the park and those are part of the park and they are not dedicated to the uh, to this public right of way. That's a good clarification to, to make. Thank you. All right. As far as questions, so one one thing that I'm interested in, and everyone knows this, and and I, I think it's not just me. I think it's uh, there's a growing movement for healthy food options. Um, in terms of um, the current food policy, healthy food policy, or current food policy that Recreation and Parks has for concessions. Um, you know, I've worked with your department on the healthy lunch programs during the summertime in partnership with LAUSD. Um, and seeing that Los Angeles uh, has a greater childhood obesity epidemic than the state does even, and the state of California has one of the worst obesity epidemics for, for, for children. Um, it's very important that we, when we talk about what types of food items will be sold in our park systems that we talk about healthy food in terms of the concessions. So um, could you talk, Mr. Regan, in terms of items that are restricted or uh, an emphasis or a focus from your department on, on healthy food options for families in parks? Well, yes, of course. Um, so the Department of Recreation and Parks uh, does um, um, abide by the, the city's well-established healthy food policies. We also have um, some policies of our, of our own uh, adopted by the commission. Um, so with our summer lunch program, which really isn't applicable here, but just as an example, we really need to have um, healthy choices. Um, we, we have um, really every day of the week, there's at least 50% at least healthy choice in the lunches, if not more. Um, now that we're partnering with LAUSD, it, and they have very similar policies, so it's easy to, uh, to accomplish, and the, the percentages of healthy food choices are even higher. Um, in terms of our vending machines and all of our other concessionaires, um, like for example, we have concessionaires that operate at a number of different facilities. I'll just give you a couple examples. One is at our miniature golf course in the, in the uh, San Fernando Valley. There, obviously, uh, People come and have birthday parties. They like to have pizza, et cetera. So those, um, those types of foods are allowed. However, they do have to have at least 50% healthy food uh, choices available, even at the um, concession. And then in terms of our vending machines that we have throughout a number of parks, it's exactly the same. Um, our operator has much higher than 50% healthy choices. We don't have anything in the vending machines like, um, like uh, 
high sugar sodas or energy drinks in particular. I give the example of like Barnsdale Park in Hollywood, our vending machines, um, pretty much you can get very healthy um, type, different types of uh, juices or you can get um, water. But if you want to get all the kind of like the high sugary and energy drinks, you have to go down the hill to the machines at Kaiser behind it because you can get it there. How ironic. <laughs> Kaiser. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm teasing, but it's actually the truth. So we, we have a very strict policy, and we do adhere to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, assuming there is an eventual policy at, at uh, recreation and parks, in, in our parks for sales and service, do you anticipate the ability to absorb the costs for enforcement, compliance, regulation? Um, are there resources or funds to, to do that? So um, let me answer you in reverse order. Um, in terms of resources and funds to do it, no, there are none existing. Um, would it be uh, costly? Um, because we don't know exactly what the program will entail because it has not been completely um, you know, created. So we don't, we, at, a, at, a, at a point in time when we know what will be expected, then we'll be able to put budget numbers to it. But I can tell you right now that no, we're not ready to just absorb that, um, either the enforcement and or the regulatory um, requirements and or the permitting. Mm -hmm. So those are gonna be, um, there is going to be a cost and there is going to be a significant amount of work involved in doing that. Mm -hmm. The way we envision this working is that, and the way that we've worked all along with CLA and with um, essentially what would be happening in public works is that whatever, so the way I kind of describe it is like this. I don't know what the program will be because obviously the council has asked for a number of options and it will be up to the council as to what we finally do mm -hmm. in, in sidewalks. Mm -hmm. But when that program's done, whatever way, shape, or form, there will be some regulatory um, you know, uh, check checkoffs that individuals will have to go through to get their various <clears throat> permits, whatever those might be. Um, of course, there'll be, you know, the general things like health department and business tax and all that kind of stuff. But once they get through that process with this sidewalk vending, they'll be sort of cleared to do vending. And, they, and the way we envision it is that they will then come to Department of Recreation and Parks. We will have... Uh, set up, we will need to set up like a one-stop shop where individuals can come and get permitted wherever, you know, we're not going to send them all over the city to, mm -hmm. to try to get a permit. There'll be some location they can go to and get these permits. Um, so they will be able to come to the Parks Department once they've gone through this um, process and already been cleared um, and received their initial permits. And they'll be able to receive a permit from the Parks Department as well. Um, now the caveat is uh, where is it? So going back to my original statements about park purpose um, and the charter, uh, so where is it appropriate to have these types of permits and parks and where is it not? Well, that will need to be established and we've been looking at that. Um, how many numbers of permits per park? In some parks it may not really matter. In other parks it might be very important. I will give you an, um, an example. Let's use Echo Park again because we've already talked about Echo Park. So Echo Park has a variety of different um, uh, features within this um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, average size park, not huge, not small. Um, and there is a concession. So there is a, uh, a competitively bid concession that the Parks Department has brought in a private concessionaire who runs a really great um, cafe operation. And um, they sell varieties of different foods. They've actually revitalized the whole community. And the pedal boating is now better than it's ever been. So we wouldn't permit, uh, say, like push cart vendors to stand right in front of this uh, this concession because it's kind of like not a good competition type of um, situation. So maybe on the other side of the park where you're far enough away from the concession that uh, you might want to buy some type of a, you know, a popsicle or a drink or something like that. But the point being that would have to be established and there'd be areas in the park where the vending permits would be allowed and areas that there wouldn't. And I think 
In some parks, maybe it doesn't really matter if an individual was to push their cart through, stop at the play area for a little while and keep on going, so that would be fine. Like, there, we could issue a certain number of permits. Okay, so case-by-case case basis. Case-by-case. Case. Okay. Um, and you mentioned, you know, we're talking largely about, about food sales, right, consumption of, of food products. In terms of, uh, you know, the county health, uh, county health department regulates that and permits that. <clears throat> Um, is it accurate to say that all of our food concessionaires have their county health permit? All of our existing food concessionaires are required. And so have, to have, that. Have, have you consulted with the county health department in terms of what food sales uh, in the parks, how that would also be regulated, how that would be permitted? Would it be through a similar system that we do our concessionaires? or? Yes. Um, the county health department has been involved with uh, our internal working group. Um, they issue different types of permits for different types of foods. Uh, for example, there are permits for health, uh, for, I'm sorry, for cottage foods, which are basically pastries and um, foods that are not considered high risk. And then there's uh, other types of permits for potentially hazardous foods. Um, so they, so all vendors who sell food would be required to comply with that requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Kevin, you, you brought up the whole proximity and, uh, and to a, an existing concessionaire in terms of what could be sold on carts. Have you all anticipated um, any sort of accurate or somewhat accurate number makes sense in terms of a park? Say there's a park that doesn't have a concessionaire and it is a three-acre park. Have you thought in terms of would there be a square footage formula for numbers of, of food carts that would be in the park? Have you all thought that through to any degree? We have not at this point. Um, a lot of the technical um, requirements and placement restrictions would all have to come back. Uh, we were hoping to get some direction from council mm -hmm. in terms of what the type of model that the council was interested in adopting and then come back with the details in terms of the permit process, licensing requirements, placement restrictions, mm -hmm. and operational requirements. That all depends on what the, the desire of the council okay. is. Okay. I would keep in mind the idea of a non-competitive clause. I would keep in mind um, you know, some sort of selection criteria. Uh, would it be by lottery? Per, you might have dozens of carts lining up to go into a park per day, but obviously you're going to have to limit the number uh, based on how large the park is or what variety of products are sold. So I think those are the kinds of uh, factors that are going to have to be thought out in terms of, of permitting. Uh, and in terms of that also, permitting office, I understand that the, there has been a, a vision for creating a, a separate permitting office of recreation and parks, and you kind of referred to it a little earlier, Kevin. Um, how big, how many people, how much cost? Uh, has, has that been thought out to any degree? <clears throat> I mean, uh, Councilman Kevin Regan once again. So I could... Uh, I, we could generate very theoretical uh, um, information regarding uh, you know how many and where and but we haven't really done that because I saw it as being work that just from my experience would have to be redone. So the work we have done though is to look pre preliminarily at parks that would have issues in terms of. Um, non-competition clauses in our existing concessions contracts, which in, in some cases there are, mm -hmm. which means that that concessionaire that has a sort of a brick and mortar concession in the park has really the, the rights uh, to all sales in that park. Um, in some parks, uh, as an example, in Sepulveda Basin, um, in Balboa Park, in the Sepulveda Basin in, in San Fernando Valley, um, the concessionaire that operates the food concession there also has an option to operate um, ice, sort of like ice cream truck, trucks and hand carts, and they have the right of first refusal on their contract, so no other carts are permitted in that park except the concessionaire. So, you know, we've looked at those types of situations, but in terms of 
how much it would cost to do this permitting. I mean, I just really don't know. We'd have to get, we'd have to gauge what is the demand mm -hmm. and um, really what is the program, depending on the, how the program plays out. So let me, let me give you a couple scenarios to try to help you with just envisioning our, our challenges. If the Department of Recreation and Parks has to like fly solo on this, on this it's gonna be much more costly, much more labor intensive, and much more difficult. That's why I mentioned we see it as sort of, I see, I see the most permitting challenge being um, getting the health department permits cleared, making sure the individuals have their business tax registration number, handling all the other you know, regulatory issues that, you know, compliance of the carts themselves, are they doing cottage food, are they doing this, are they doing that. Once that's all established and, and they are eventually kind of like cleared in all those areas and ready to vend, then they come to the parks. If the parks has to actually do all that for each individual rather than them going through, say, this other process and then we just give them a permit for the park, it's going to be much more labor intensive for us. Okay. And then in terms of, you know, anytime you play by the rules, there has to be an enforcement piece. Correct. Who, who do you see as the enforcement arm making sure that permitted uh, vendors and permitted vendors only are in our parks. So then, um, if, there's, there's, I have something to add to that. That's the, the question. But I'm very aware of 4200M, which is the special permitting district that uh, came into being mm, some 20 years ago. And it was tried at MacArthur Park. It failed miserably only because there were several um, small businesses that wanted to play by the rules and they were just overrun by everyone who didn't. And it just destroyed the district and it, it, it wasn't successful. So the lessons learned, but the bottom line is there would need to be an enforcement piece. And so, yeah, please. So um, we'll just, we'll both answer that yeah, one, but sure. let, me, let me start by saying that um, Felipe has uh, um, put together some theoretical um, analysis on how it could be, how these uh, new regulations could be enforced in the streets and sidewalks. Um, in general though, just and before Felipe answers so you can kind of know about parks, in general, um, the Los Angeles Police Department is responsible for all uh, municipal code law enforcement within the city uh, park system. We also have a very small contingent of rangers. However, we are working to build the ranger program. If it's envisioned that rangers do that, we certainly would need to increase their numbers. Um, however, for the parks department, our enforcement agency is the LAPD. And then Felipe has a little bit different angle on how it'll work in the streets. Mm -hmm. So uh, currently, uh, vending on sidewalks is enforced by uh, the police department and the public works department. Both uh, enforce on a complaint driven basis. So they only respond to incidents re depending on complaints that are received uh, from community members. Um, any changes to that would, you know, would have to be made by the council. If council chooses to uh, make a more proactive type of program or change the type or level of enforcement, that really is up to the council. So, a concern I have is, you know, before we had what was called the Office of Public Safety, which were a branch of, of law enforcement that, and in high numbers, they were assigned to our parks. That was absorbed into the LAPD, and we have basically very little, if any, enforcement in our parks as it is now. Um, I think that if we do this the right way, and there's no other way that we should do it, we're going to have to take a look at, at that again as well. Because if we enact some sort of system and then there is no um, oversight of it, there will just be bedlam at all of our parks. That's just, that's just how it will be. Um, and so we have to think in terms of something beyond just the LAPD enforcing a permitting system at our parks. I know it doesn't sound, you know, optimistic for me to talk like that, but you live and learn, and that's just how it is. So uh, I would recommend taking a deeper look at some sort of permit verifying system in our parks uh, as, we, as we roll this out so that, that, again, the small businesses that play by the rules, they register for their business tax, they register with the county health, they're permitted, they go through all of the um, requirements 
uh, to do this the right way. If we don't set them up to be successful, this system will fail, and it cannot be the LAPD to enforce. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Uh, and I'll open it up to my colleagues at this point, and I might have a few more follow-up as well. And we're joined by uh, Councilmember Curran Price. Mr. Price? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the, uh, for the report. Uh, you know, I'm excited that we're moving forward on this. Obviously, lots of details, lots of things to, uh, um, to solidify. Um, but um, and I know they're not going to be the same exactly. But to the extent we are moving forward on street vending, I think we should try to make sure that the rules and regs requirements are complementary and that we, uh, you know, try to unify um, as much and simplify as much as possible so that it's convenient for us to manage uh, and provide oversight and, and enforce and easy for the vendor to know, you know, what to expect. So um, uh, the only thing I would add is you, as we move forward on this, I think there should be a limitation on the numbers at parks, whichever, you know, and again, I think we should be flexible as you suggested some. Um, could could uh, uh, you know have a larger population of vendors than others? Um, we should be open to that. Yes, Councilman. I believe I certainly believe we we could be flexible, and I think that um, you know the way I envision it is that permits could be issued to a point of. I mean, obviously, you don't want to have like this, some saturation point, which it, but really that doesn't oftentimes occur, except in certain parks. Um, and we we kind of know, I mean, MacArthur Park has always been just overwhelmed by vendors, so it might be a much more intensive program there. But in your average park, you're not just going to be overwhelmed by vendors. So there's probably not going to be too much of a problem getting a permit for those individuals that want it. And yes, in terms of your first comments, Councilman, you're absolutely right. We, we actually want these um, two procedures to be very much uh, integrated. It doesn't make sense to have duplicate procedures, one in the street, one in the park. They really need to be integrated, and it's going to make it much easier on us. It's going to make it easier on us to issue the permits, to monitor them, and then to enforce any um, uh, and, you know, violations as well. So, yes, we want to do that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Bloomingfield. Um, I don't know if you guys have explored the, the technology side of this, but... You know, with this permitting aspect and, and having all these different vendors, there's a real opportunity for, for an app, you know, and where you, you can clearly see at any given time who's permitted where. Uh, and that may make this, you know, I, I, I still don't have my head around how all this is going to work by any stretch, and part of it's because I'm not on the other committee that I'm dealing with this, and I'm trying to get my head around it. But um, have you been working with ITA at all to develop such a thing um, where people you know, can see when they when they would be permitted, when they wouldn't be permitted. The other vendors would know who's permitted at any given time, and it would be easy for enforcement because you just use your smartphone. Uh, and that being said, is that the smartphones are pretty well penetrated now. Even even the 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 newest entrepreneur um, who may be struggling in many ways, chances are they have a smartphone and they could probably punch into the app to say that they've arrived at a park and they're they're vending at this time. Has that been looked into at all? We, ha we have not, but we have looked into, into the process in terms of the steps that an individual would have to take to obtain a permit. Um, and that includes, that's for both um, food vendors and non-food vendors, uh, including the fact that they would start with one central department and then be referred to either the county health department or a permitting agency to issue the permits. I think that there is an opportunity there to incorporate uh, technology to improve the process. Yeah. I guess I would urge that we do that, even when you talk about having a permitting office and where you put it and all the rest. I would think you'd want to have at least the availability of a virtual permitting office. You have folks from all over the city trying to get these uh, permits, and it's these are the kinds of things that, that exchanges that can really happen online. So I would I would push for that. I'm going to look for that as the proposal moves forward. Uh, so I'll definitely come back to that, and, and I'm happy to work with you on that and, and even get my committee to look at that um, uh, as well. So um, other issues, you, you know, you mentioned on the parks, under the charter it has to be necessary for, a, has to serve a park purpose. But then you also mentioned, well, we'd look to see if it's necessary. So I was wondering how that, and in between the word necessary and park purpose is a, is a pretty wide uh, chasm. Uh, in that 
there's very little that's necessary for a park, but something could serve a park. You know, bringing uh, ice cream cones to kids after a little league game probably serves a park purpose, but it may not be necessary for that park. Um, similarly, someone selling, <clears throat> you know, athletic gear uh, may be, under some stretch of the imagination, appropriate for a park because people are doing athletic activities, but probably most of us would agree that it shouldn't be, we, we don't want to turn our parks into flea markets. So how do, you, how do you draw the line on that continuum, and how have we been doing it, and how do you project that that may change in terms of parks? So yes, I think you're absolutely correct, Councilman, in your, in your observations that something could certainly serve a purpose but may not be absolutely necessary for the park. So it doesn't have to be, and if I said necessary, then you know I, I will correct that uh, word. It doesn't have to be necessary for the park to serve a purpose. You're, you're correct. So um, it just has to be in line with, uh, with the needs of the public using the park or the facility itself. So the way it has happened and the way it probably will continue to happen is typically um, either the parks department uh, itself determines that there is a particular need uh, many times we will we will um, establish those needs in conversations with local communities, park advisory boards, neighborhood councils, or even um, a council office contacting us and saying, "Hey, you know, we really uh, a lot of people are asking us if the, you know when they walk around a certain area of the park, there's no opportunity for any water or drinks or et cetera. It would really be nice to have an opportunity there. So that's how we do it now. Um, there are some established long-established um, concession buildings in parks, like little cafes and ex that have been there for just many, many years. So we continue to operate those as well, unless they become, um, for some reason, not necessary. But there, yeah. So that goes to what, what the products are that they're selling. So you, you license a vendor to sell specific products? Uh, I mean, how does that work? If a vendor is licensed to sell in the park, they're licensed to sell, you know, food products, I guess. But they also might be licensed to sell little trinkets or, or the blow-up uh, balloons or something. How does it, you know, we're not going to monitor every, everything on their cart or as they get a new product in. How do, you, how do you draw the line when they have, they're going from a balloon to a, you know, clothing to all of a sudden they're, it's a flea market and they're selling uh, used furniture in, in the park? Um, we have discussed the you know the the issue of what types of items to the city would allow for vending and if it's non food items we've contemplating uh, having the council either establish a list of items initial items to that would be um, vendors would be able to sell or to limit it to like new items um, to establish certain limitations so that there's some sort of sort of control for uh, to allow the enforcement agencies to, to act. So it really is up to you to decide what types of items you want to allow. However, just to add in, thus far the council has, has asked us to allow both food and merchandise. In parks or overall you're saying? Overall. It, excuse me, in general terms or is that the extent of it? Or? I mean in general terms, yeah, we're looking at, I mean there's many individuals that um, do sell, that may not sell uh, food only, they sell both food and merchandise on their carts. So we would have to so further refine at, that. We're looking at methodologies to allow mm -hmm. um, both. And obviously there's a difference in a concessionaire, in concessionaires, and you have to distinguish that. If you're the concessionaire at the golf course and you're licensed and you're, you're selling, you know, clubs and, and gloves and all the other stuff, and I mean, that's, that may be fine. But if you're in the local park and you're selling you know, gl gloves and golf clubs and you're, you know, there's no golfing anywhere nearby, then that's a different story. So this is where the differentiation between parks and sidewalks will come in because it's not going to be um, the way, at least the way the Parks Department envisions this, is that we want to be a part of this process. We believe that the council is heading in the right direction with, uh, with what they're asking us to do. Um, however, we also believe that the parks should not become just a, you know, wholesale uh, swap meet of some type. Um, so 
really what people sell and how they do it will need to be regulated by the parks permitting process. That's what our permitting process will look at. And what we, we don't want to look at did they meet all of their different health department regulations because that'll be done. They'll just be able to prove that to us. However, we do want to look at where do you want to go and what do you want to do. And let's remember that in parks, we're not only concerned with, as a matter of fact, some of the least amount of problems that we have are with people that just might push an ice cream cart through the park. What we really have is people that conduct um, very um, sometimes problematic businesses. That we've given the example and testified in uh, full council of uh, an individual who came to Hanson Down Park and set up a pony ride with completely unregulated animals. Um, we have no idea whether these animals had had, had their veterinary care, their vaccinations, you know, whether they're being abused. We have no, nothing. We have no relationship. There's no insurance. Huge liability for the city. I mean, the funniest, I, I don't want to say funny, but the most interesting uh, entrepreneur that I saw was a guy who set up a bicycle shop in a park, 10 by 10 canopy with all his tools and the whole nine yards. I also think that the Parks Department when we move forward with this permitting program, we'll use a lot of the practical knowledge that we've gained from years of operating a very similar system in Venice Beach. I mean, everything from lotteries to space to people saying, oh, well, why does he get to stand there? Because that's a better selling spot. I'd rather be there. You made me stand over here. So, you know, it, these, all these things come into play. And it becomes very complicated. My goal will be to try to create a system that is not so cumbersome that it becomes impractical, but yet can be user friendly and also um, meet all the objectives of the council. And we may want a bicycle shop along the LA River. We may. Or, <laughs> or something, but but mm -hmm. ideally, we have a way to, to regulate that and so that it's not just open ended. So, what I'm hearing from you is that whatever the overall street vending, issue is you want to have an additional screen for the parks uh, that you get your street vending permit which allows you on the streets and then there is a is an additional screen to get into the parks is that that's how you understand it as well mr. Chavez? Chavez? It, it may not have to go through if they only want a a a, a permit to vend them parks they would only go to the parks department. They'd still go, if the city establishes an agency, a central agency for individuals to be informed about the different uh, policies and regulations in both parks and public works, then the individual would have to just abide by the rules that are established by uh, Rec and Parks if they choose to vend in parks. So they don't have to go through a screening process through uh, public works department unless they want to vend on the sidewalks. guys agree on that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of at a loss on that one. Let me just say this. Um, speaking for, I mean, obviously I'm speaking for the Parks Department and our general manager. We do not believe that Public Works will be, uh, has the jurisdiction to, to permit vending in parks. So we will need to be the agency that does that. Um, what we are hoping is that the city's program would screen the individuals before they get to us. As as simple as I can put it. Gotcha. Well, and again, it'll be easier for the consumer or, and even for the vendors if there's a central, if it's all virtual, they don't have to know if they're going to Public Works or Rec and Parks or wherever in the city. They have a central portal they can get to and do things that way and, and the rules can be laid out clearly because this is going to be a little bit of a jumble for folks who have different rules in different places, both on the streets because we have, under the hybrid plans, we have different areas potentially. Uh, and in the parks where different parks are have, have different rules. Well, this is true, Councilman, and I think that um, we can either make it as cumbersome and complex as, as we can, or we can make it more streamlined, and our goal is to try to make it simple. Um, in reality, we just have to always remember that parks and streets are different legally, and they have different um, needs. There are some vendors that would only want to uh, vend on sidewalks, and there are some that may only want to vend in parks, and there's some that may want to do both. Mm -hmm. So, a bunch of questions. I'll ask one more, then I'll turn back and sure. maybe join in the second round. But I don't want to hog the time. But uh, this is a, a random parks question: Is in parks you sometimes see, like you go to the little league game, and you have uh, the parents set up 
to support the team. They set up a hot dog stand and a pizza and selling things, and they, it's like a big bake sale. Um, how does that work with vis-a-vis -vis the vending and everything else? Because it's a whole other, uh, whole other realm. Are they getting permitted for that? Would they still be allowed to do that? Um, and I guess for a number of teams, that's how they raise, a, raise money. And they're not just selling to their own team like an internal bake sale. They're, you get the notice that the parents are going to do a, a fundraiser for the soccer team, and you go there, and your team, you can buy stuff, but people on the street can go buy stuff as well. How, how does that work, and how does that fit into the whole scheme of things? So the, the um, Parks Department currently has uh, procedures available for special events and fundraisers that can be held in public parks. Those permits are issued through the local recreation center. If it's a program that's taking place at the rec center, then the teams fall under the, um, the ability to run a snack bar for fundraising efforts um, related to the park itself. So if that, par if that park director permits the snack bar, then they have the ability to do that. So that's already, that's uh, integral to the program. Um, however, if some group just wants to come on to the park and they're not associated with that particular, so like when your children are involved in a sports program at the park, the director has jurisdiction over that and it's a parks program. So that fundraiser is really being operated by the parks department de facto. However, if a group just comes on and wants to run a fundraiser, set up a 10 by 10 canopy and just say, hey, come by, you know, these snacks or whatever to help our cause, they can also take out a permit for a fundraiser and they can be permitted to do that in the park. That, that um, process exists today. Okay, so that's sort of an independent track that can yes, the, live the, or die independent of whatever we do with the... So uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the, we have um, the, the Department of Recreation and Parks has a very extensive permitting um, uh, process today. We, do, we, we uh, um, issue all different types of permits for many different things, and the rules are established by the um, Parks Commission, and we have a <clears throat> pre-established um, manual of rates and fees that the Commission has uh, approved, so, um, and, and they, the Commission empowers staff to be able to issue these permits today for various activities. Um, the reason that we can't just use that system right now to start permitting, you know, these push cart vendors is because it would just be much too um, cumbersome and um, we currently do not have a rate and fee for that push tarp cart type of vending. It's much more along the lines of what you described, special events and fundraisers and other types of permits that individuals may want to take out to use the park. Thank you. Mr. Rue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Councilman Rofero earlier brought up about MacArthur Park um, and one of the key problems why it didn't work. But is there anything else we should know about the MacArthur Park um, special vending district that was a failure or, or attributed to it that you want to point out? Um, well, no, I mean, I think that, no, I, actually it was a great idea and, and it, worked, it worked well um, except for what, uh, what eventually happened is exactly what the councilman described. Um, so these individuals um, who took part in that special vending district, um, primarily a number of different types of um, tamales and other types of um, foods were, were available. They were cooked foods, so they needed to go to a commissary with their cart every morning. They needed to be in very sanitary conditions. They needed to abide by a number of different rules. And they needed to take um, some food preparation training classes. So for the operators that um, engaged in that, it was, um, you know, it was a lot of effort and time consuming. And so when they got back to the park and they saw all these other people there uh, who hadn't gone through the training, who didn't... Uh, who didn't take part and didn't go prepare at the commissary and, and spend all the extra time and money. It was um, not only it was an unfair competition because it was costing them more money to um, abide by the rules, but it was also demoralizing to just, you know, the individuals. So eventually people just started quitting and saying, I'm not going to do it. So as the council member put it, um, council member Farrell talked about enforcement was a huge and enforcement was very difficult in that particular program. So I think that enforcement will be the key because obviously you'll have people who follow the rules 
It's going to be a little bit more time consuming for them. It's going to require much more effort, and it may require some upfront uh, costs of doing business. If those individuals take the time and effort to follow the uh, prescribed program, then yes, it's incumbent upon the city to make sure that we enforce properly so that the individuals who try not to follow the rules you know, also uh, w won't be allowed to do that. Yeah. So, so on that note, and Councilmember Price also um, brought up a, a key point that I'm also very concerned <laughs> about. Since we have the uh, citywide sidewalk vending ordinance also um, being worked on, I'm afraid about possible uh, a dual system and um, and I and and I'm very encouraging like all like how everybody else said it, to see how we could better coordinate and I don't want to um, and from what I'm hearing it seems like for parks it's going to be the jurisdictions on jurisdiction for permitting is going to be under uh, recreation and parks and um, and I'm uh, it's not that I'm for or against it it's just I look forward to the future briefings to see how it's going to work out because I would hate for um, um, a duality in systems where we're doing uh, where di different departments are doing the same amount of work. But when it comes to enforcement authority, can you um, and, and and my colleagues already beat it with a dead horse. But um, when it comes to enforcement, could you guys possibly look at broadening the enforcement um, jurisdiction as possible, uh, where if it's only Rex and Parks who could if it's only Rex and Parks Rangers who gets to enforce in the parks, and then it's um, LAPD who gets to ha enforce in sidewalks, and then there's these areas that the other council members point brought out where it's questionable, right? If we have a ranger in the park, um, or, or a park official in the park enforcing, and there's someone on the street, which should be, they should be able to, so there's or vice versa. Right, so those are all really good observations, Councilman, and you're very correct. And um, let me just tell you a couple of things. So Los Angeles Police Department has jurisdiction on all public property throughout the city. So there's nowhere that they can't go to enforce. They, they can go in parks, they can go in streets, it, it doesn't matter. LAPD, the, they are sworn peace officers, they have the right to um, enforce these laws anywhere. Um, Rangers are the same. Uh, park rangers are called park rangers, but they're sworn peace officers in the state of California. They can enforce laws on the streets. They can enforce them in the parks. It, it doesn't matter. Um, they, they can? I thought they were only in the parks. Well, they, they're, they're, they're primary, um, their primary deployment area is public parks, obviously. But it doesn't mean that they, as a, as a sworn peace officer in the state of California, if they see some type of a violation of law in the in the public right of way, they certainly can address it. There's nothing that says they can't. Um, so it doesn't mean that that's what we would do. That we would have rangers, you know, doing all the code enforcement out on the streets or or vice versa. There is one thing to be aware of: um, public works uh, does have code enforcement officers. Um, they have the ability to. Um, enforce these types of, of lower level um, you know municipal code violations and in public in in the public right of way at least from what we were hearing in our working group it'll probably be the code enforcement officers for the most part that'll be monitoring this sidewalk vending program it doesn't mean that we couldn't look and the council has the authority if there was some jurisdictional problems to you know and obviously maybe beef up the number of code enforcement officers and have them work in parks as well in terms of the duality of permitting, I agree with you and really don't want it to be cumbersome. But the, we have to remember that the Parks Department has to have the final say and our commission has the authority to say no to these types of permits. So we cannot have another agency permitting. They're not, they, there's no jurisdictional processes for another agency to permit in public parks. So. It doesn't mean that we couldn't have some type of a joint office where Recreation and Park staff members could work side by side by Public Works. I mean, in actuality, the council had this idea many years ago when you started the um, constituent service centers where um, representatives from multiple city agencies working in the same office to make like a one-stop shop. I mean, I certainly see that. Our Rec and Parks uh, employees that are doing the permitting could be sitting right next to um, code enforcement employees and issuing it all at the same time. So it doesn't mean we couldn't do that or do the whole computerized, you know, smartphone thing. However, um, 
these are all things that we need to look at as the council further directs us on how they, uh, how you believe this program should be played out. Well, you know, I'm very open to the chairman's idea about looking at all options like possibly the Office of Public Safety again. And, you know, and also even parking enforcement, you know, um, because there's a lot of um, uh, food trucks as well. So I don't know how that fits into all of this again, but I mean, I don't want to, I know you guys are still working on it. I look forward to updates. And the last thing is um, when it comes to enforcement, I mean, it's always a situation of budgets and lack of staff. Um, while you're looking at the fines, fine structure, could you also, um, the CLA, if you guys could report back on um, keeping the fines or whatever fees that are collected to stay within the permitting or enforcement jurisdiction, whether it's Rex and Parks or Public Works, so um, we could make sure that there's a special fund? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Rue. Mr. Koretz. Yeah, I, well, I would sure. agree with some of the direction of uh, the conversation about enforcement. I think uh, leaving any piece of this to LAPD as the primary enforcement mechanism would be a mistake. Um, as I thought originally and, and am convinced that uh, uh, getting rid of the GSD police was a mistake because then LAPD has to prioritize and going after vending carts that are placed illegally somewhere is never going to be a top priority of LAPD when major crimes are going on that are of, of uh, greater concern. So I certainly would like to see only one entity focused on resolving it. I'd be happier if we created our own entity to make sure they really had a razor sharp focus on enforcement. A um, couple of questions I have. One is, it's still not entirely clear to me what the parameters of vending are. And where I have a question is more in terms of services from pony rides as the most substantial physically to yoga classes or dog training classes. I mean, if someone does, does a dog training class, are they a vendor? Um, there are a lot of parks where people do that now on an informal basis and don't get a permit from the city. And I don't know if anybody cares that much. Um, where, where you go to sales of food, where you go to sales of just about anything, um, where do you draw the line? <clears throat> So, um, yes, Councilman, so in terms of services, those services uh, that you described all do require a permit, whether it's dog training, whether it's uh, yoga, whether it's a fitness boot camp or even a personal trainer that comes to the park. And do, so f you, have to you have to remember that for many years uh, there, on, there was on the books a um, municipal code section that prevented, um, made those types of activities illegal unless the individuals um, obtained a permit from the Department of Recreation and Parks. Those uh, municipal code sections were suspended for many years, uh, nearly 10 years, because of li ongoing litigation um, um, in Venice Beach, which was eventually adjudicated. So we did bring back to the council and you did approve an amended ordinance that does and, and went into effect, uh, it became enforceable on September 29th of this year. So once again, the Parks Department can now work with LAPD and Park Rangers to enforce those provisions. So individuals that run a boot camp, uh, have a pony ride, open a bike shop, you know, first, the first blush is, is that does this particular activity serve a park purpose? Certainly yoga and the other uh, uh, types of activities do. Then we look at, is it appropriate for where this person wants to do it? And if the answer is yes, then we issue a permit. It's issued from the local park, from the park director at the local park, under the authority of the uh, Recreation and Parks Board of Commissioners, using our established um, uh, schedule of rates and fees. So we can issue those permits today, and we do. 
Now, are there individuals who come into the park and try to manage uh, to operate those types of activities without a permit? Yes, particularly the yoga, the boot camps, and that because they do those very early in the morning, and many times they might get away with it unless um, there's a particular complaint or unless staff comes in early and notices it. However, um, we do encourage people to get permits for those. They do need to get their insurance cleared, and they do need to have. Uh, um, some basic certifications to be able to operate those types of programs. So if, if we have um, an opt-out opportunity for districts, does that mean, or an opt-in opportunity, do you have to opt into every possible vending service? So if you were in a district that opted out, would that mean that you couldn't approve someone that had a dog training class or a yoga class? I think the, answer, the general answer is no, um, but let me clarify that. So it's important to realize that the Parks Department has a very robust permitting process and system today to permit all the types of activities that you mentioned, yoga, dog training, boot camps, fitness, you name it. Those can be permitted today and they routinely actually are permitted under our commission approved guidelines. The process that we're discussing here today and the process that Recreation and Parks has been collaborating with uh, the CLA's office is really what everyone calls this sidewalk vending or like push cart vending. That's a different type of vending, that's a, a different type of activity and we, Rec and Parks really has no methodology today in place to permit these types of carts. So this is really the only thing that we're talking about is the individuals um, who are selling things correct. in one way. So all the other types of activities, we could already permit that. And there's a system in place and it's, it's fine. It doesn't need any, any changes. And uh, initially there was a question about the good food policy and I'm not entirely clear um, whether we're not sort of in the same uh, sort of Uber and Lyft situation where you hold taxis to a certain price and then you let Uber and Lyft charge whatever they want. Um, so we have a good food policy. We make our vendors supply um, a certain percentage of, of healthier food. And then we have people in push carts all selling a bunch of unhealthy crap and we're permitting it. How do we avoid that? Or can we ever avoid that where even if we give permits, they change what they're selling and we're not really monitoring it that closely? Well, I think at least, you know, I have to say from just years of experience and also um, being with Felipe, who I might add, he did a very fantastic job of just conducting seven, six, six community meetings uh, in various communities around the city actually speaking with um, the street vendors, the sidewalk vendors. Um, these types of foods that uh, many of them, I mean, you know, you could probably term them as being unhealthy, things like bacon wrapped hot dogs, etc. I think when we buy a bacon wrapped hot dog, we're not joking ourselves that it's, you know, a healthy choice, but Nonetheless, it's a choice that many communities have come to love. So those are the items that people actually like to buy from the carts. So I think you have to have, whatever policy gets uh, adopted, I think the council has to have some type of a balance between um, healthy choices and still being able to offer those, those types of foods that people, you know, just love. I mean, I had a friend that was from Philadelphia, and all he could do was talk about a Philly cheesesteak. So, you know, that people come to, this becomes a part of the fabric of their life. So I think you really have to strike that balance. Oh, I'm thinking, you know, you have a snack bar in a, in a particular park, and then you have carts that have every kind of uh, candy and, and ice cream and every possible worst diabetes-inducing choice. At some point, you either have to limit that, or you have to go easier on the snack bar and let them have more of the stuff. Just... Just saying, okay, you're the guy paying for the facility and we're limiting you and these other folks can get away with selling whatever they want. Well, 
kids want to buy the good tasting junk. So given the choice of only that, the push carts will get a lot more action and the, uh, the, the, the snack bars won't. I think you're exactly right. And when we establish the locations and numbers of and types of vending in parks, we want to be cognizant of that. Um, it, it's a very valid point. And two last concerns. One is uh, I think MacArthur Park is actually possibly a very good analogy because my fear is you have thousands and thousands of vendors that do this illegally. Um, some of them may not be able to come up with the money for the extra process. Uh, it's by nature an illegal activity and everybody's been doing it illegally. So what would stop 10 vendors from being permitted in, in MacArthur Park today and 100 vendors descending upon it while it's going on also all over the rest of the city. Um, how are we ever going to enforce that? Um, and do we see this program actually working if we expand it? When we couldn't do it in MacArthur Park, how are we going to do it in a big chunk of the city? That's my, my greatest concern. I think part of the challenge was that MacArthur Park was a very small area that was where it was permitted. So you had more area where it wasn't permitted and prohibited, and you had a lot more vendors throughout the city. The park itself could not accommodate as many vendors as there was a demand for. So um, I think even at that time, back in the uh, 90s, the, um, the intent was to establish more than one district, but only one was established at that time. So because it was just that one little area, everyone that wanted to vend all showed up there. That may have been one of the problems, but also those that were that actually made an attempt to go through the process uh, found it more difficult to vend, um, having to go to go through all these uh, requirements, um, a lot more costly, as we said earlier, and also having to um, to be restricted to a certain location. I think which that would be what we we're talking about doing today, correct? I'm sorry, Councilman. Could you say that again? Are, are we not talking about restrictions and training and cost and being restricted to one area? Not necessarily. The, the council hasn't taken action in terms of what, what uh, model the council desires. We spoke about, you know, the, uh, the citywide model, the district-based model, and the hybrid, which is a combination of both. So either way, the, the districts may be, may be bigger as well if, you, if council chooses to have a, um, a district-based model. If you have a citywide model, even that can be restricted by exempting certain areas that, you know, for public safety or traffic or congestion reasons. Well, I, I, I'm not necessarily a fan in any case, but I, I am concerned that if we are going to move forward, we actually find a way to do it right. And I'm very nervous that if we expand this too broadly, the broader we expand it, the less likely we can enforce it, and the more likely the people that go through the process are overrun by the people that just do it illegally. So I hope we, we think that through as part of, part of the process as we go forward. All right, I'll tell you what let's do since the time is advancing. Let's do one quick power round because I know there are a few more questions because we have another item and then there's another committee that's going to meet that I'm on at 1 o'clock. So I think we can kind of wind this one down. Um, but, but having said that, um, uh, just a, a point that I want to make in terms of uh, back, back to food for a moment. And, and uh, after we wrap this up, I'm going to make some recommendations for, for the report back to this committee. Uh, in terms of hot food, cold food, propane tanks on park properties to prepare hot food, something to really think about very, very thoroughly. Um, also, refrigeration for cold foods. We're talking about equipment, um, uh, kind of equipment required to, you know, then sale or, or sell what you, the products that you want to, to vend. So, uh, a, a very important consideration to make in our parks um, in relation to natural settings, surroundings, uh, et cetera, um, uh, something to address. Okay, so with that, we'll go to, to, to Bob once again and then the decurrent as well. I sort of a big picture question on street vending. How much of it is 
coordinated in the sense that um, I know a lot of the, I hear different things. Some of the street vendors are independent contractors in the sense that their, their equipment is owned you know, by a larger company. A lot of these companies, you see all the same products in a lot of the street vendors. And I ask this question in terms of, because it may have some relationship in terms of how we, how we regulate it. So what is the relationship? Are folks just leasing the equipment? Is there a sort of superstructure to some of these vendors in terms of how they're all controlled um, that we could take advantage of? How does that, how does that work? Um, in terms of the, the, the public input that we received, um, there may have been a combination of both uh, vendors who represented themselves and also, uh, well, I wasn't really aware of any vendors who were part of any organization. Um, I, I, I do know that I did a little bit of research in terms of the costs and um, the cost to buy a, an ice cream card, the push card, is around $4,000. So um, my take is that it may be the case that some of these vendors don't own their own carts. Mm -hmm. So they may be leased, they may be part of a different uh, organization, uh, but I do understand that some of the vendors that are selling other products are their own, uh, they own their they, own business. They all have the same products, seem to have the same distributor. It seems like there is a, if not, a, and I've heard different things, but either on the distribution side, but there are some larger entities that are, um, either supplying all the vendors or coordinating them in some fashion, um, both for good and for bad. I've heard this on the good side. I've also heard it on the negative side that sometimes uh, there's some gang activity and they're controlled in different ways and asked to, to pay unfair uh, tax. Uh, and so there's, there's issues there that we want to make sure that we're aware, cognizant of. Just, <clears throat> Councilman, just from uh, experience with enforcement, on various uh, issues in the past, we have found that many times uh, vendors, a variety of different types of vendors are not just uh, independent working on their own, that they do work for a larger organization of some type. <clears throat> we see that with um, flower vendors, and we see it with push cart vendors. So uh, many times these individuals uh, who are actually doing the work and the labor are getting substandard wages, um, poor working conditions, they're subject to um, a gang intimidation, you name it. Um, so, and the sort of parent organization doesn't really provide much protection or care for them whatsoever, and they almost are considered like uh, disposable. If that person can no longer do it, there's another person that comes right along. We're hoping that this particular process will actually help that problem, and by being by legitimizing some of these operations, will provide more opportunity for those people who um, would like to make a fair wage and and believe that their uh, labor is worth something. You know, and we at the community meetings we saw a lot of very hardworking, dedicated people that just wanted to uh, do their job and raise their family. And that's what I, we hope that this process will accomplish. That's absolutely what we see on the, you know, the vendors I've talked to all seem to fit into that category. So the question is, how do we, how do we bolster that? How do we make it so that there's not wage theft going on as well as part of this process and that we're, if we're going to be in effect licensing this, we're not, we're not licensing, you know, we know who we're licensing to and it's not some uh, you know, either super distributor or inappropriate group or whatever it is that we that we take control over that piece. Right, of and if it is a distributor, then they're going to have to care for their employees and pay them appropriately under this process. That's for sure. But I don't know how we get at that through our regulations, and so I Will just put, put that out there as something. Could you put that up? Okay. Well, sorry, I was speaking for Felipe on that one. Well, that, that's an issue that we can address within our working group and make sure to report back at the future meeting. Great. Thank you. Mr. Price. Um, well, first of all, I just appreciate the thorough discussion, the thorough discussion that we've had uh, this morning on it. And, and thank you both for the series of hearings that we did have on this matter. It was, I think, illuminating for everybody. Uh, and I think uh, our conversations even today, though, indicate that there's still lots of unanswered questions, things we need to tie down. But we know that other cities have been able to do it. And so I'm just confident that we can come up with some kind of a plan, some kind of a process, some kind of a regimen, you know, that will uh, be fair to the public, fair to vendors, fair to brick and mortar. 
uh, as we move forward. But I think we've got to find a way to uh, consolidate the, the process, the forms, the approval process in a way so that it, you know, so we don't have to. I mean, I understand your concerns about the park having final say over the parks, and, 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 and I'm not disagreeing with that, but we just got to find a way to make it more transparent. Thank you. Mr. Rue. Yes. Um, I don't want to start an in-depth discussion, but um, I'm fully supportive of um, regulating and doing what we're doing with vending. But um, I'm very concerned about possible criminalization uh, when it comes to enforcement. And I know Councilmember Gil Sadio also had the uh, concern as well. Do you know where we are in that discussion now? or? Um, at this time, we have reported um, to Economic Development Committee relative to the different uh, enforcement agencies. And we've explained that uh, it really is a, um, the choice of the council to, to decide the type and level of enforcement if you wish to change uh, either the enforcement agency, the type of enforcement for going from uh, uh, complaint basis to proactive, or the level of enforcement as well. So you'll come back with options? Yes. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, before I make re my recommendations, uh, we do have two speaker cards on the item. Mr. Chavez, thank you. Mr. Regan, thank you for all your work on this very complicated, <laughs> nuanced issue. Uh, and you. first, uh, we have Greg Bonnet, uh, followed by Rudy Espinosa. And both of you gentlemen can come up to the table. Hi there. I'm Greg Bonet. Um, I'm with Public Council, um, and I would urge this committee to direct the CLA to report on a vending program for parks that is simple, that's inclusive, um, that provides opportunities for vendors, and ends this uh, nearly blanket criminalization of, of street vendors. Um, I appreciate the in-depth discussion we had today, um, and but I was a little concerned that the um, there didn't seem to be a recognition that with more stringent regulations, that's actually going to increase the enforcement burden. And that was a big problem with the 42M ordinance. The regulations were very minute. It was very much micromanaging. And with that meant that only a few people could comply, many others were excluded, and that made enforcement costly and ineffective. If we have simple, common sense regulations, most people will come into compliance, and enforcement will not be expensive or, or difficult. So the key is to have simple common sense regulations that vendors can opt into. Uh, Council Member Kretz mentioned that many people are working illegally right now, and he's concerned that they'll continue to work illegally. But those vendors face very serious fines, their equipment is confiscated. If they had the opportunity to enter into a legal vending regime, almost all of them would. And the idea that You'll, have, you'll still have a large numbers of vendors outside the regulations is not going to be a problem. So making it simple, inclusive, um, and, co and with common sense regulations is going to minimize the enforcement costs. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bonet. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rudy. I'm the executive director of a community development organization called LEARN. Uh, thank you so much for the discussion. I really enjoyed all the questions and your engagement in this issue. Uh, Councilman O'Farrell, thank you so much for keeping this issue on the radar of everybody. Um, I wanted to just say two things that are important to, to my organization and to a lot of the organizations that I'm working with. First is we need to ensure that the par that parks can be used by the public for leisure. It's an important thing. That's a, number one. The second is we need to protect the city from liability. It's a really important thing. Um, but what we believe is that entrepreneurs can help us with those two things. We, if we engage them, we, they can help us make sure that our cities, are, our, our parks are safe and that folks are able to use them for everything people love parks for. We believe that if we create a clear regulatory system, very clear that everybody understands, uh, we can make parks even better des destinations in our city. In the six public hearings that were mentioned, hundreds of people came out and said, this is possible. We want to participate. Vendors said that they wanted to pay permit fees. They wanted to, to abide by the laws. We should, we should really take advantage of that opportunity because this is Los Angeles and, in my opinion, the best city in the country. I, and so I wanted to encourage you all, and it seems like you're on that right path. Um, but, you know, the last thing that I want to say is that, you know, parks are also an opportunity for healthy food incentives to engage the entrepreneurs that are really good acting citizens that want to participate. 
So let's look at those opportunities. Um, our, our organization has, has a lot of data that we're very happy to share with you, as, as well as a lot of members of the LA Street Vendor campaign of 60 organizations have done a lot of work in partnership with scholars. Uh, the last thing that I want to say with my last 15 seconds here is let's put some strict deadlines on ourselves, and we're happy to sort of help you do that. Uh, we're entering year three of the legislative process, and we're still asking questions and still trying to figure it out. So, um, you know, we only live once, so we're, we're here. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, colleagues, so I have some recommendations that I'm, I'm going to make. Um, I would like to uh, instruct Recreation and Parks um, to provide a list of parks, including the size and the proposed number of vending permits per park that you envision could work. Nothing we, we're doing right now is etched in stone, but we just need more information. We need more contemplation about what we feel will work and what we feel may not work so well. So I think it's time to start moving in the direction of envisioning how this can indeed work. Um, uh, in the city council district, um, it, it, by the individual city council districts, identify each park that has a concession agreement in place, report back on that so we can get a clearer picture of the cohabitation of existing concessionaires and then uh, encouraging and, and permitting um, other sales and services in, in parks in proximity. Work with a food policy council to come up with healthy food options and recommendations for consideration. Um, and keep in mind also, again, the existing concessionaires and the regulations in which they have to abide by. Um, work with the CLA and CAO and all other departments as necessary to report on enforcement options, including complaint-driven enforcement, proactive enforcement, and within that context, uh, the enforcement and regulation of the types of equipment that will be allowed in parks. And I encourage, I encourage the departments to think very creatively about enforcement that doesn't necessarily rely on the LAPD. Um, and then a second part of that uh, request is a permit structure framework. I think it's time to start envisioning what the framework of a permit structure would look like uh, in conjunction with, you know, the, the other sort of um, item that's moving forward on a, on, on a similar track, and that is uh, vending on, on city uh, sidewalks. Um, taking into account implementation of this program in phases with necessary funding and staffing costs. Very, very important to anticipate. Also, let's take a look at the technology and the applications and the, and the better use of technology in envisioning a permit process for sales and services in our parks. Um, and let's take a look at the, the um, keeping the fees, fines, uh, registration fees, et cetera, within the Recreation and Parks system. Just if you could report back on maybe it's an existing, maybe that's nothing new that we have to do. Maybe that is already something that is happening. Maybe the charter allows it. Maybe the charter forbids it. But let's get a report back on keeping the funds, the, the, the revenue raised within the park system for the specific purpose of sales and services in our parks. And it's, let's also... Uh, take a look at uh, enforcing the minimum wage from anyone who provides sales and services in parks. Let's keep in mind that um, that's something very important that we just approved this year, and we don't want to look the other way and just hope for the best for people who uh, vend in our parks. And la lastly, let me just say that this is important across the city. It's very important in my district so much so that I requested and uh, was granted a separate meeting on this in my district. And Mr. Chavez did such a great job um, with that. And we heard from dozens and dozens of people on every side of this issue. Um, and it was a very respectful conversation. It was a very informative conversation. I stayed there until just about the very end because I wanted to hear uh, what everyone had to say. 
I've always felt that sales and services in our parks can work. It's part of Los Angeles culture. It's part of what I feel um, enriches us as a society. And I have felt for a long, long time that if we're going to do this, as Mr. Rue, I think, said, or Mr. Koretz, uh, we can do this right. We can certainly do this right. But we have to consider everything, including the successes and failures of the past before we move forward with this. Because, as I mentioned before, we want to set up the small business, the entrepreneur, we want to set them up for success. If we fail in accomplishing that, the whole system will fail and it will bring everyone down with it. Um, uh, and I fully agree that we need to figure out a sensible, um, streamlined process that's verifiable and enforceable. Um, and we, we owe it to everyone to uh, um, explore every possible element of this uh, before we roll it out. So we'll keep this in committee, and we look very forward to report backs uh, on, on these items. Um, thank you very much. Uh, with if no objections on these recommendations, we will move forward on these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings us to item... Six. Item number six, Department of Cultural Affairs report relative to the arts development fee program and the expenditure and fee status report for fiscal year 2015-2016. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, I'm Felicia Filer. I'm the Director of Public Art for the Department of Cultural Affairs, and I'm joined by Tanya Picasso, who is the arts development fee program manager. Also out in the audience, I'd like to introduce our new assistant general manager, Daniel Chirica, is here. Today's his first day. Welcome, Daniel, and congratulations. <laughs> and we're also joined by Rhonda Mitchell, who is the arts development fee manager, uh, also working on this program. We asked council for a new staff person last year, and so we're pleased to have her on board to help us with um, all the work. Um, before you is our... Uh, Department's Arts Development Fee Expenditure Plan for year 15-16. Um, this report is, a, is, is um, a response of the Administrative Code Requirement Provision that requires the Department to submit uh, an annual expenditure plan showing the status of the Arts Development Fees paid in prior years, the current year expenditure plan, and the balance of fees in the Trust Fund. This report is, um, is basically sort of you can think about it, there's three sections. The first section identifies the priority fees for fiscal year 15-16 that we need to make uh, council findings on this year. Otherwise, the fees may be subject to refund. Our department has met with every council office to identify the fees that are in there that are priority fees and to identify specific propo proposed uses. And those, identif those projects are identified in the report. Um, it's important that that council make finding on these report, on these projects before the end of the fiscal the end of the calendar year. Also, there's a uh, FY 1516 fees to be used for a new temporary public art project called Current. Um, our department applied for a grant uh, through the Bloomberg Philanthropies to develop a citywide temporary public art project. We received uh, a notification in June that we received the award. And we had um, went to council in April of 2015 to uh, identify uh, arts development fees to use to match, to match the Bloomberg grant. And so this report shows um, the exact addresses that we're proposing to use uh, for that match. Um, we worked with the city attorney's office to, to agree to use um, fees that are under $10,000 to form the match. And we are um, roughly using $68,000 per council district uh, for that initiative. And finally, the report also gives a brief summary of the arts development fee projects that were uh, uh, determined in 14-15, uh, uh, the status of those fees, the status of the projects that were completed, the ones that are in progress, and um, the ones that remain to be uh, completed this year. Um, there is one caveat in the report in that it does not reflect um, the interest accounts that have not been allocated to our trust fund yet. We have a new accountant, and so we're working to uh, make the interest allocation, and we also have not sort of uh, back out or, or, or back taken out, removed our uh, administrative uh, costs and fees from each of the appropriation accounts. So we'll have a more um, detailed 
um, accounting of the, the actual trust fund balance in, in another couple of months once the new accountant is up to speed. So with that, we'll take any questions that you might have. Terrific. And did I understand your last name, Picasso? It is. As in the great painter? It is, yeah. What a great legacy you're living. Yeah. Thank no, you. thank you. Welcome. All, all right, so a um, uh, few questions. Uh, how are, you, you have reached out to all the council offices in terms of the current uh, distribution of arts development fees. Yes, we, we And, and uh, how's that going? Has everyone, are, are the fees, uh, or, or the uh, monies uh, identified and the projects identified in all the council districts? <laughs> are we getting there? Well, you've met with all 15 council offices, and we actually did get, um, uh, responses for specific projects for I would say about half of the council offices the other half have um, projects identified in this expenditure plan and attachment a but some of them are placeholders so we're working with the council offices to get that information so by the time that we go to council in December we can have a very detailed um, um, project okay we think we'll be in pretty good shape in a month absolutely yes. all right fantastic um, and If the projects ultimately aren't developed, and that sometimes does happen, how long is the funding good for? Indefinitely, or does it come back to the Arts Development Fee Fund? Or um, It's our understanding, according to the State Mitigation Code, that once council makes findings on these fees, it stops the clock, and then we have another five years to okay. deploy the dollars. So. All right. I'm, so you know, things change. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's, so that's good. So, so then... Uh, should that occur, then a council office could just reprogram that into a different project. Yes, There's no, no hiccup with that? Okay, terrific. Um, is there a breakdown on the interest that's been collected and how, uh, since the arts development fee was frozen for so long, um, is there a benefit uh, of interest collection as a result of that? Yes, each account, each appropriation account has um, a column that shows the interest that's been accrued to last year. What we haven't done is updated the interest uh, uh, amount earned on each account, and we're working with our accounting division to do that now. So um, one of the requests in the report is to instruct the department to to accrue the interest appropriated to each account into the appropriation account so that we can spend it as part of the, the public program. So um, as I said uh, earlier that this report, it includes uh, interest on each appropriation account uh, up until last year and we're working to add the, you know, the most recent amount of interest earned. Terrific. So once we re approve this report, maybe you can, once you get that refresh on mm -hmm. interest, you can let us know. Yes, uh, all we, we expect to have it by the time we come to council in December. Perfect, perfect, thank you. And, and colleagues, just an announcement is that public works and gain reduction will meet at, at two o'clock, not one o'clock, so thank you. So we have a little bit of time, but um, okay, questions, um, comments? Okay. Mr. Price? Uh, well, this is uh, another exciting uh, development, glad to see. Now, are, are these funds available now because we've resolved that uh, one block geographic radius issue, or is that still to be resolved, or? Is that impacting these, the expenditure of these funds at all? We are no longer subject to the one block radius. Um, the, the new interpretation of the ordinance has um, um, broadened the interpretation of how the fees could be spent. However, the fees, there still needs to be a reasonable relationship to the fee, uh, where the fee is generated to where it's being proposed to be used. So in all of our projects, we look for that specific um, reasonable relationship requirement. But there's no real geographic no. Uh, requirement for the project versus the expenditure? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thanks. As part of the new guidelines that we adopted, which really opens up um, the possibility of, of creating great art across the city, if we can establish that nexus before we were bound by that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's a, a positive development because of the guidelines. It still has to be in the council district, right? Not necessarily. Um, some of these projects could be uh, citywide, or the, the fees could be used for citywide um, projects, such as the current public art biannual, which, which is what we did with some of the fees that were under $10,000 um, in each council district to pull them together. Mr. Bloomfield, more? Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I jumped in as a uh, yeah, follow-up right, question, right. but I didn't want to jump the line. So, so I'm done. Yeah. Okay, uh, sorry. So, so, that's interesting. so it's, uh, it can be used overall, it's council district, but the council district that the fees are generated in generally is the one that's going to be proposing the projects. 
in that area. That's the way it's, it's worked in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and it's specifically those are for the fees that require immediate findings. So, for example, the fees that, are, that have been accumulated in your district this year that we need to make findings on by the end of the calendar year, we're working with your staff to identify the specific council district priority project in that for that <coughs> set of fees. However, other fees from the district um, are being used to support the citywide initiative current. Um, but there will also be a temporary public art and programs as part of that initiative in each council district that justifies using the fees from those districts. I guess for generous fees. So if, if I wanted to, to take some funds out of Councilman Roo's district next door, which I don't want to do, but uh, <laughs> for a project in my district, um, you're saying technically that's allowed, but it obviously would go through a council motion to do that. The, the administrative guidelines state that if you wanted to take Councilman Rue's fees and use them in your district, we would have to show, show what is the relationship between using, you know, for the fees that were developed in his district to the fees in your district, and also the, he would have to approve those. Right. Yeah. And uh, the council would have to approve it. Yeah. Yes. Not, not the individual council. There is that check yes. in place. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the five, I wasn't quite clear that there was, we had the whole problem where some of the fees were running out, which we, we, dealt with a couple of months ago. There, are there any fees that are currently in danger of running out and what, what, how does that clock work? Well, those are the priority fees listed in the report and, and those are the ones that we, that we have to make findings on before December 31st. So as long as we make findings then there are no fees subject to be refunded out of this year's right. report. But then does next year a whole other set of uh, projects that, that hits that time window, then we have to have another set that has to be done by December 31st and so on and so on? That's correct. Yes, and our, based on the administrative guidelines, it's part of our process now where we will be doing annual reporting for those fees that will um, be reaching the five-year mark at that time so that we're never in that predicament again to have fees that are subject to a refund. Great, thank you. Sure, the, the great news here is that with billions of dollars of investment in Los Angeles to have this fee now unlocked in the coming years, not so, in the not-so-distant future, we're going to see real, a real benefit of unlocking this arts development fee uh, ordinance. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's really kind of incredible. I think in the, in the coming few years, people are going to see some important art projects, um, and that's why. So, yeah, thank you. Mr. Kretz? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm still not entirely clear on what the geographic requirements are now. So. If uh, we had a project built at uh, one corner of my district uh, near Culver City at uh, Venice and Robertson, and we wanted to use the money to help a museum start up in Encino, uh, would that still be viable, or would it be laughable because of the distance, or how do we look at that? It's all within CD5, which happens to be probably the broadest district, one of the broadest districts. Um, so. What if it's done at one end and used at the other? I think the challenge for that example would be that we would have to de determine what is the relationship between using the fees in Encino versus um, where they were generated on Venice and Wilshire, and if Venice and Robertson, if in fact we could not il demonstrate that the users of the development at the Venice and Robertson would actually use the, the fees in Encino, then we would not um, be able to agree to use the fees in that way. We would look for fees that were generated in a closer proximity. So that's the, the, the reasonable relationship test that we uh, undertake with each um, project. The question uh, we'll for me, I, I sort of get that. That's why I used an ex extreme example. Mm -hmm. But where do you draw the line? I mean, if, uh, if you did it at, uh, at, at Venice and Robertson, could you put it in... Uh, you know, the Fairfax area near CBS, or how, what's, what's the proximity? Is the, do we have any guidelines at all that, that help us? The guidelines don't refer to a geographic relationship, but it's, it's, it's the use relationship. So if, if we can demonstrate that people in the Venice and Fairfax area will actually travel to, you know, another part of your district, that that's, that, that, that cultural amenity it, that doesn't exist in the, peak, in the Pico and Venice area doesn't exist and therefore people would travel to the other part of the district to participate in the project, then yes, there's a relationship. Because there are parts of the district where there's very little cultural infrastructure and, that, and people that work in that district will have to travel a little bit further to, um, 
to, part to partake in the arts. And so we can make a relationship, but it has to be you know, demonstrated and informed. Um, and if we, can't, if we can't logistically say that people from Robertson would drive to Encino, then that uh, use of the fees would be denied. Right, and people on one side of the hill tend to say they never go to the other side of the hill, so that would probably be a longer, a, a longer shot in making the argument. Um, I'm still not entirely clear on what, what allows for your money to be swept, so, and, and if that's happened before and still is a danger. So how do I keep arts money from being swept in my district? Well, according to the State Mitigation Fee Code Act, which our arts development fee is modeled after, um, if the fees uh, have been paid into our trust fund and they haven't been spent or a use identified after five years, within the first 100 days of the fiscal year, which is where we are now, council has to make findings on those fees so that they're not swept. So as part of the administrative guidelines, council instructed us to make a report uh, and to within the first 160 days of the fiscal, 180 days of the fiscal year to identify the fees that we need to make findings on, determine what the use would be, get council approval so that they're not swept. So we've identified those fees uh, for every council district and, and have determined, working with your staff, what the proposed use would be so that they're not swept. So that would be a relatively small percentage. It wouldn't be the whole five years worth. Correct. It's right. only the ones that exceed five years. Okay. Um, I think you've answered my questions. Thank okay. you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, seeing as there are no other uh, comment or questions, I would like uh, to move the report, approve the report, DCA report, and, uh, and the plan, and move it to council. And just with the caveat of well, as soon as you have those percentage uh, interest numbers, if you could let us know. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Without objection, we move it forward. Thank you. And that brings us to general public comment. We will first hear from Wayne. Yes, uh, good news in CD3. Or the, they sent the building inspectors out as part of the attempt to shut me down. All has been repaired two days in advance. So now your little retaliation will be just fine. You will go to the wall. $10,000 later, the trees have been removed. The area has been cleared. And now the wall is, is perpendicular and correct. See, you play these games. You had me arrested on Tuesday. You held me for 13 and a half hours. Torture is illegal in this country. It's, in fact, it's illegal under international law, let alone federal and state law. Just to come up here and speak for a couple of fucking minutes in a meeting, you have to do these things. Cost me all this money. I don't give a goddamn. I'll spend the fucking money, and if I need to get the money, I'll get more if I need it. Because one of these days, the, the, the tables are going to be turned where you're going to fucking pay me. Okay, so right now, have your fun. Send your jackasses and do what you have to do. But see, the one day is, is that I'm going to catch up to this and get on that surfboard, and I'm going to ride that fucking wave. Okay? So I beat this deadline by two days. I had a crew out there yesterday, Sunday. I had to pay overtime to get this done. Because I want to be sure to be ready for this bullshit going on because I want everybody to know that this is what happens when you talk against you guys. Michael Hunt is going to talk continually against you guys. We are going to continue to talk because this city is going to go bankrupt. And when it does, we'll be on the record as the ones who told you when you didn't do anything about it. And we will close public comment on an up note uh, with Michael Hudson Medina. Thank you so much for your time. Um,
coming to this working meeting, I am just in awe of all your talents and especially all your comments of so well thought out on what you discussed today. I really just want to mention that before. What I'm here to talk about is that uh, way back in 2013, there were some motions for the relocation of Channel 35, and I don't know if all of you have gotten all the designs and layouts and because when you do the committee meetings you don't have this it's just you know talk and speech of visions but then now the visions become reality you get a clearer picture and I know with um, the vision 2030 there's some backtracking going on in council with the lawsuit that was you know, put against the city so Again, there are always opportunities to revisit and rethink things. And so my whole point here is to just say, well, um, did anyone ever think about Quimby fees? Because we're talking now about the new um, arts development fees and the Quimby fees that are collected for the parks. And what, what are parks? But we have parks, historical parks, cultural parks, nature parks, sports parks, and they're all for the benefit of the city, uh, city citizens and for our visitors. And no greater park that I know of is in our El Pueblo uh, de Los Angeles Historical Park, which is a conglomerate of all the uh, federal, state, county, and city levels. So again, um, maybe you know, opening the minds and ideas of what um, the historical park could be. And uh, I just wanted to say I made this for you guys. And if you would like to each have one, uh, just to what our history is all about. And then on the back is what they're planning to do with our history. So thank you so much for your time. And I wish you all a good day. And continue the great work that you guys do, because you really think through things through. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hudson Medina. And I would recommend also that you get together with uh, our colleague, uh, Jose Wiesar's office. And uh, do you visit the El Pueblo Commission hearings as well? OK. They know who I am. All right. Terrific. Again, I just want to make everyone's aware of what's happening. Yeah. Because you put through things, and then you sometimes don't see how they develop. OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, um, seeing as there is no further business, uh, no. we call this meeting to a close. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.